Oh, there are a number of personal factors. I'd had two years of community college teaching in Iowa at Marshalltown Community College in the middle of the state. I liked it very much. Um, I was did not ever really see myself as an academic in the university sense that I would do research and publishing. And, um, the idea of, uh, of a college having that kind of relationship to the community, making higher education accessible to people in the community. Um, it, was, it was just attractive to me, and there was something, um, I, and I love teaching. After I got over my initial stage fright, which probably took me about 40 minutes, I think. Uh, so it was, a, it was a teaching job, not a research job. If I tried to go someplace like, like Michigan, to teach, I would have had been expected to publish and do research, and I just didn't feel that the world needed another elaboration of uh, Alexander Pope's use of the ampersand in, the, in his poetry. You know. So, I like teaching, and I and I liked uh, the community college. I started in 1969, which was the second year of classes. The first year, 68, was in a warehouse on 115th Street, I think. When I started in 69, we had a few temporary buildings in the middle of the campus, and my office was in a private home that was still on the property. I had a bedroom, I don't know. We had a kitchen, <laughs> we had a living room. There were four or five or six of us in the house. Um, how big was the faculty? I don't know, a couple hundred? Even that? Well, I don't know, a hundred anyway. I mean, in, in the very first years, no. I mean, we were still building departments and, you know, curriculum and, and everything. So 50, 60 maybe at, at the beginning. But we very quickly added other, other people and we, you know, buildings got built, and um, we had the uh, the temporary buildings, which are out sort of where D is now. I think uh, there were about ten of those who were like Quonset huts. I remember my my wife and I came to campus once. I just wanted to show it to her. She was um, she'd never seen it, so we came out. And it was it was evening or night, and and it was the the campus was built on an old sod farm. This was a sod farm before it was a college campus. And it was completely level, and it was treeless, okay? no berms, no trees. And in the middle of it were these 10 or so Quonset huts in the dark. And in the middle of those was a flagpole um, with the rope twisted around it and the metal turnbuckle that held the flag clanging against it in the wind. <laughs> And I said, this is the campus. <laughs> and it was kind of like, oh, really? <laughs> no, it was hardly Etonian. It, it, was, it had a very uh, definite sort of counterculture feel to it because the college set out to be different. And the college without walls was one part of that concept, and the habit, not having departments was another part of that. Um, the thing about no walls, I always suspected, was just a way to save money when they built the buildings, and the philosophy was a justification for it later, and we found that we really probably did need walls after all. Frankly, it never bothered me. I have a pretty loud speaking voice, and I just held forth. <laughs> but uh, uh, it did it did interrupt instruction for a lot of people, so the walls had they had to come. But the the mix of people that was the 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 buzzword was the grand mix, so that we were all we were encouraged to see each other as as all part of the same enterprise, and as a family perhaps yes. When Moraine started. The oldest community college in Illinois was Joliet, but I don't know that there were too many others. And uh, it was it was a period when the whole movement was really, really booming. So 
And I really liked, uh, I didn't know much about this part of Chicago. I lived in the, up in the north part of Chicago, uh, in Evanston and in Wilmette. And uh, I, I really liked the south side. I really liked the kids at, at, on campus here that had the leather jackets that said south side Irish and south side Italian. And, you know, the, the neighborhoods, the, uh, the closeness of the neighborhoods and that sort of thing. It was a very strong sense of identity and community in the South Side. So it was it was it was fun. Well, a lot of our students were first generation college students, so they brought um, and and I really got a sense of this one semester when I was traded uh, with a professor at Northern. We did an exchange, and I went and taught his classes. It was actually during our strike, and he, uh, so the agreement was that he and a graduate student would come to Moraine and teach my load, and I would go teach his load. Took two of them, right? Uh, so then we had a strike, so that's kind of put me in an awkward position. So I negotiated with, with my exchange partner, Eric, Eric Garib, nice man from Northern, and he agreed not to come to Moraine and teach and I agreed to go to Northern and teach. So I was teaching at Northern during the strike for no pay and he was being paid for not teaching at Moraine. I think that's the way it was. And when I got to Northern, I encountered a very different kind of student. They weren't community college students. They weren't first generation. They didn't get in your face. They didn't ask questions. They weren't... Uh, uh, and I even asked one young man at, at one point, he turned in a paper, it was, he had no idea what he was doing. I said, why didn't you come and talk with me about this? You know, I, and when we were talking about his revision, and he said, you don't understand, Mr. Sullivan, here you don't bother your teachers. And I, I really didn't want to teach in an environment like that where pe nobody would bother me. I mean, hello. <laughs> you know? Please come and bother me. That's what I'm here for. And, um, and the students that we had here at Moraine could be coaxed into that. They would. Some of the most interesting students I had were kids that looked like they should probably be in detention center <laughs> somewhere. But it turned out they had a lot of questions about philosophy and literature and things like that, too. So. So yeah, there was a counterculture thing. The other thing I wanted to mention was we had, uh, we had started to have a lot of returning veterans too. And they added, uh, they added the whole Vietnam thing, you know, to our campus. Uh, some of them were in kind of rough shape. Um, all the ones that I had were, were pretty good students. You know, they'd been, uh, but they were, they were an older presence. And of course, we always had older students. Uh, early on, I had a man in one class who was uh, about the age I am now. He was 70. Mm -hmm. And uh, his name was Thomas Elder. I'll never forget that. <laughs> and uh, that, that mix of older people returning, um, people who maybe had a little school or had, had gotten married and had a family and, or had a career they wanted to chase, and now they were coming back. That mix with the, uh, with the regular age students uh, and the returning veterans was really quite, quite a potent combination. A lot going on. Early on, we didn't have a union, and the administration came from Michigan in a situation where they'd had union problems and really didn't want a union here. And I've heard that from a number of sources. And that probably would have worked out fine if they'd put some policies in place, but um, the faculty felt that we were getting stonewalled on some basic policies like sick leave and you know other things that needed to be spelled out in a contractual sort of way. And I remember being on a committee to come up with policy, I think it had to do with leave or sick leave or I, I can't remember even what the topic was, but we worked on and off for several months. And then I uh, had a meeting with the president, uh, Robert Turner, to present our, our suggestions. 
And before we could do that, he said to us, now before you present, he said, I just want to take a few minutes. I've had an idea. And he took the next half hour or so to outline his solution to the problem we'd been working on and asked us to go back and reconsider everything. And uh, that was a, <laughs> was a very eye-opening and frustrating little session with the president because it became clear that the work that we had been doing and taking seriously was not really terribly important to him and was probably not going to guide any policy decision making and that we had been kind of stalled. So shortly after we had a we had a unionization meeting in Mitch Caper's basement. I think it was was it Mitch Caper somebody's basement. And I went and uh, we decided that we needed a union if we were going to have um, a platform from which to negotiate some of these issues. And we voted for it. And I can't remember if the strike was the first or second contract after that. It came fairly early. And it was kind of a moment when we had to demonstrate that we were a legitimate power. And the only way we, a union can do that is to strike. Strikes were illegal then for college teachers. And I learned later from the man who was my dean that he had been told to replace everybody, to have replacements for everybody and that it was highly possible that we might all have been fired. As I say, I was off at Northern teaching for no pay. And so. <laughs> but I attended some strike meetings, which were in the church right up on the hill at uh, Keene Avenue and 107th, now a Greek Orthodox church. It was a Roman Catholic church originally, and deconsecrated, I think, when we had our union meetings. If not, it should have been shortly after. The meetings were interesting because they were like they were like any union meetings that I've ever seen in a film. They were like steel workers or dock workers or whatever. You would think a bunch of intellectuals with all the degrees that we had in the room would get together and have a reasonable debate and a good conversation instead of clenching their fists and shouting slogans, which is largely what we did. <laughs> so <laughs> it turns out that w where those kinds of struggles are concerned, that education maybe doesn't change pe human behavior all that much. So we, we had a strike, and, and uh, it went on, I don't know, several weeks, and there were picket lines. And I got to walk the picket line when I wasn't teaching at Northern for no pay. And then it was settled, and after that, for the rest of my career at Moraine, we had essentially very amicable relationships with the administration. And contract negotiations, once or twice, would hit a little snag, but um, they went pretty smoothly. We had good contracts. We had good health care. We had like three-year packages. I felt settled and secure. Uh, but yeah, the union thing, it was, there was a sense of crisis. And as I say, it, it was illegal for us to strike, not to unionize. That was certified by the appropriate federal agency, but but for us to actually call a strike was illegal. And uh, you know, there are stories of tires being slashed and things like that, but I I don't know whether to credit those or not. But the the mood was the mood was tense and you know physical and confrontational, and and we were you know when you get to a strike, I mean the lines are really clear. You know, nobody that I know of crossed those picket lines and came in to teach. And I don't think they ever would have recovered from that in the years afterwards. That was a pivotal moment in the history of the college. Uh, and I think it, it got resolved ultimately in a good way, you know, had a positive outcome, that the confrontation was really necessary because the administration needed to be confronted and they needed to be told hey we've got some concerns here and they're not being addressed you know and you and that's your job and you have to you have to come up with something and if you don't have some base of power 
There's no reason for them to have to listen to you uh, except out of the goodness of their hearts. And as I say, my, my understanding of the history of those folks is that they came with strong anti-union biases. They did not want a union here. They thought that unions had no place in education. As a matter of fact, in 2015, they're about the only place any unions are left in this country is in education, so. Which is sort of ironic. Well, Dick, Dick was a great influence on me and a friend for, you know, 40 years or 30 years, however long. Uh, he just died a few years ago, two years ago, I think. Um, David Bishop, who left eons ago to pursue a film career in California, was another early friend and, and uh, influence. Um, You know, and th there've been a there've been a lot of other people who I admired and liked and was friends with and so on. Mary Ellen Ponsford, uh, the painter, taught art. Um, trying to think. I still meet on a pretty regular basis with about six other of my ex colleagues for a little uh, some games of chance. So I still see uh, Doug Gerke and Jay Noteboom and Jim Rule and uh, Ron Savara and Ron Falstick and J Jay Noteboom. And uh, I don't know if it's a function of our age or if it's the truth, but we all pretty much generally agree that we were here during the golden age, that it really was a pretty idyllic time, that we had a lot of freedom and authority to create things and um, that we were well paid and you know taken care of in that way that we had pensions to look forward to and that they were not at the time controversial and so there was a lot of really good good things about it and and we felt proud of you know building the college really so The open concept meant that we were not housed in departments. So I had uh, roommates and friends uh, all through my time here who taught in other disciplines. And uh, it's one of my best friends was the chairman of the math department, Dick Fritz, who I shared an office with. And we went to computing conferences together. And the two of us later teamed up to help establish a lot of the computer labs on campus to see that they got bought and, and they were used early on largely for word processing kinds of things. And, um, and I actually taught uh, in the computer program here. I taught a course in, in logic programming. So, you know, that, that, um, that was very attractive to me, to meet people outside of English and to get that sort of cross fertilization. And then in the 70s, one of the things that I did that was probably the most innovative, um, we had a team teaching situation that involved three courses and I think nine teachers and a class of 90 that met every day for about two hours. It was called the vertical team, which is an unfortunate uh, name, but it, it gave credit in Composition 101 sociology and humanities and instead of um, instead of teaching to topics in our specific disciplines we taught units that we created and we created them through a series of meetings uh, one of the units was Chicago so for two weeks we looked at the history the politics the art uh, the literature of Chicago you know, it was a, and it was an exciting way to teach. It was exciting to teach with people who had different perspectives from different disciplines. And um, we learned a lot about each other. We, uh, we were given some, some courseworks uh, in, in how to conduct a meeting. 
and, uh, and what group dynamics are all about and, how, and to how to really conduct a meeting, not just to have one of those meetings with a gavel where you get votes done and so on, but to have a meeting where people's uh, feelings are important, where the process of communication was important, where people would stop the meeting if they wanted to talk about some issue that they thought the group was avoiding that might be uh, something like, uh, I think this group has really gotten frustrated with this. We should, we should take a look at that. So this was not the usual kind of meeting that I was used to. Uh, and, and under those conditions, when you're trying to create education with a group of other people, uh, you get to know them pretty well. Um, I actually started teaching online in 1997 at DePaul because I wanted to. I'd been on the old bulletin board systems on the early internet and in 97 the web was new. It was new enough so that the course I taught at DePaul, I actually designed and coded the web pages myself because that would have been a hobby of mine. Uh, partly fostered by my friend Dick Fritz, the math teacher, who was an expert programmer and had worked at Bell Labs and so on and taught me a lot. So I was over at DePaul doing that and I was over there because Moraine was resisting um, in the person of some of the administration, uh, opening the college up to the internet. There was a scary proposition for some people to let the internet into our campus how were we ever going to control it? Well, <laughs> that was not a problem for me. I didn't want to control it. I just wanted to hop on board and use it. So I went over to DePaul and started. And then a few years later, I would, I would say 99 maybe, we had built some computer labs here and I'm, I'm not sure when we had our first online classes. Because I think we used Blackboard early on. Uh, but I don't. My early experience teaching online to Moraine students was not good, was never good, as a matter of fact. Um, and it was, it was very hard to get a third of the students to complete the course, to get them, just to get them through the course, to get them to stay with it, to do the work. At DePaul, I had returning adult students. Okay. They were motivated, disciplined enough to, you know, to do what needed to be done. They were paying a lot of tuition, you know. And at Moraine, I, I never really felt that online, for me, was never really successful. And I, the classes were too big. That was one thing. So I think Moraine got into the online thing, and I think I'm not just picking on Moraine here. I think a lot of places have gotten into online thinking they could reach out to a, a population they weren't capturing. So there's a whole marketing advertising thing attitude there, right? Reach out and capture them and uh, and educate them more or less, and make and make some money. And it doesn't. Never worked for me with the 18-year-olds. I have, I have really good, um, I have good classes with the older students. The relationships can be quite uh, strong relationships. That you, you can build great relationships with people online, but you have to, you have to be there. Yeah. So do they. So there's, there, are, there are economic issues here. Fundamentally, that's what's driving a lot of this now, I think. And doing education well is never economically efficient. That's, to me, that's a given. And, but we have, in the, in, in the West especially, applied a sort of an industrial model to the whole system and I read a piece uh, recently that explained why that was. Before industrialization in the West, we didn't have mass education. Why not? We didn't need it. We didn't need a literate, educated population of workers. 
So when we had the Industrial Revolution and we started having factories, what did we need? We needed people who would show up on time, obey the rules, and not make any mistakes. And to me, those are still the fundamental values of American education today and, the, and serious limitations on what we do educationally. And if you're using an industrial model, you also want it to be cost effective. And you talk in terms of product and you do time and motion studies on your faculty, you know, could you put the chalk down now? Okay, how long was that? Um, Yeah, that was an interesting experience. Uh, I got in, invited or asked to teach in the honors program, and I thought that would be fun, and that we could really do some innovative things. And I remember my background and all this innovation, right, and team teaching and creating new, new courses out of combined disciplines and all. So I thought, wow, this would be cool. I'm the best and the brightest. So I developed what I thought was kind of a challenging lit class, I think it was, and uh, some kind of open-ended uh, activities and things. And I encountered a tremendous resistance from my honors students. And I finally figured out that the way you get to be an honors student is you have a very, very high GPA. And the way you get to have a very high GPA is by not taking any risks. Because we have a system, as I said earlier, that really discourages making mistakes. Mistakes kill you. So a mistake for an honor student is an A minus on anything. And a B is cause for despair. And I was asking them to take risks, intellectual risks. And I was giving them only partially defined assignments and asking them to kind of do what they wanted to do with it. And they didn't know how to deal with that. So when I figured out what was going on, uh, I addressed it. You know, we talked about, we talked about th that. And I tried to make that class a safe place for them to take risks. And that, that got them started a little bit to open up and try things. But their instinctual reaction to doing school is very conservative and, you know, tell me what to do and I'll do it and I'll do it perfectly. But it's the factory again, right? Stand here, punch this red button, you know? Unless you don't feel like it, then punch the green one. Wait a minute, how do I? You know? <laughs> That's what I was saying. I was saying, punch the red button, but if you want to, you can punch this blue one over here. <laughs> it was like, no, that was intolerable. That was really upsetting to them. So I think the honors program needs, <clears throat> I don't know if it's still true today. I would imagine it is. And I think it needs to be addressed, uh, not just in our, our honors program here, but in our education in general. But maybe that's not realistic. You know, maybe we really do live in a culture where people can't make mistakes without getting clobbered for them. So maybe we, sh maybe we should not encourage them to try things. Just play it safe. And then the last thing. That sounds so like me. <laughs> uh, Pat McCaig started the Writing Center. Pat McCaig, did, you knew Pat McCaig, yeah. And um, it was originally about here somewhere. It wasn't here because these were classrooms, it was back in the back part. No, originally it was up front. There was a computer lab up here and the writing center had a bay over here. Yeah, okay. yeah. yeah, there was, it's a long time ago. And uh, then Pat did it for a while and then then I did it for quite a while too, and mostly what I did with the writing center was hire stu and train tutors, student tutors. So, and that was fun. I got to know a lot of students pretty well who were. That was interesting to me. It was it was kind of a hard sell the writing center. It puts another step in the process. You know, you have a paper to write, 
instead of it's due Friday, instead of putting it off till Thursday, you should really do it Wednesday and take it to the writing center on Thursday. So then you can revise it and turn it in on Friday. And that's a hard sell. But we, we did develop a clientele. I think we did some good. I think it's still around. Where is it now? In the it's over here in Maine. Over here in Maine? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think be open to the opportunities that are here for you and to the people that are here. And if you're going to teach, if you're going to teach anywhere, it's process, not, uh, not content that's important. Teaching is a process. And, you know, people, I used to have colleagues who would lament that students who had done poorly on an exam and they would say, I don't understand it. I covered everything. It's like... Well, something was missing in the process somewhere, right? It's just obvious, but there is, a, ultimately, I think when you're going to be an educator, there is a personal connection that you can't shy away from, you know? You have to be open to that personal connection with your students. They're real people, right? And not just a personal connection or passion for your subject matter. Which, all, you know, in the final analysis, the subject matter is outdated every five minutes anyway. I mean, if, you, if you read the news on the internet, or any of the novels of William Gibson. I read a lot of poetry. I have an MFA in poetry, and I, when I came back to teaching, I discovered that I could either write poems or teach, but I probably couldn't do both. So I am, I am part of that very, very small and elite group of educated readers of poetry. There are by far many, many more people trying to write poetry than there are people who read it. And I am one of the few who can actually read poetry. So it's true, you know, you go to any bar on a Friday night and people will stand up and recite poetry at the drop of a hat. But how many people want to sit and listen to it? <laughs> Especially that stuff. <laughs> but uh, so I think people I think we, people should read more poetry. I really do. I, there's a wonderful poem by Robert Bly. It's very short. I'm going to recite it. You can't stop me. Uh, <laughs> but it's a poem. The more I the more I think about it, the so very simple and short, and the poem is, I can't remember the title. Suddenly I see, with such clear eyes, a white flake of snow that has just fallen in the horse's mane. And if you can see the white flake of snow, then that's what poetry can do. but you can't see ambition in that way. So that's, for me, the essential dichotomy is that poetry is in the world of things in that concrete world, not in that abstract world of politics and slogans and advertising and other forces of evil. <laughs> not to put too fine a point on it. <laughs>